go through a lot of different health behaviors that are fundamental to public health um, and to public health advances. Um, and you know, you all might might think readily about um, norms that you've seen and that you've seen change related to health um, considerations um, in your own um, lifetime. So my uh, Ryan joined as an assistant professor in philosophy just uh, earlier this academic year. He came from Pennsylvania, from the University of Pennsylvania, where he was um, a research fellow, um, training with one of the world's leader, leading thinkers on social norms, uh, Christina Bicchieri, um, and has he's done work with UNICEF and um, the World Bank, um, as I said, on issues related to water sanitation and hygiene norms. Um, Looking forward to hearing you talk today. We'll have a chance for discussion afterwards. What I would recommend is kind of keeping in your mind norms that you've seen, norms that are relevant to the work or the areas of expertise that you bring um, for our conversation. Okay. Thanks. All right, thanks very much. So uh, what I'm going to try to do here is just give a kind of an introduction to the idea of thinking about norms in uh, a health context. And rather than go into a whole lot of detail about any particular case, I'm going to give kind of like the structure of how to think about this stuff. And then hopefully in the discussion, we can, we can uh, think through some cases. So as I read a lot of the literature, very often people focus on uh, particular outcomes that they're concerned with. And obviously, outcomes are unbelievably important when we're thinking about health policy. But what I want to do is step back away from the outcomes a little bit and instead think about behaviors. So what are the behaviors that generate those outcomes? And in particular, I want to think about the motivations that lead to those behaviors. So why do people do the things that they do? What motivates them to behave in certain ways that generate certain kinds of health outcomes? And this matters a lot for when we're thinking through any kind of health intervention or trying to formulate health policy or anything like this. Because very often we have in our, in our kind of uh, mental model of how people behave, we think of them as individual actors that are making independent choices. Right? So we think of them kind of like the way that economists think of people, that you know, they have a, a set of preferences, maybe some material constraints, they'll take in information that you give them, and then they'll seek to maximize the satisfaction of their preferences given the information they have and the constraints that they face. There's a pretty good model of how people buy TVs and a whole bunch of other things. But uh, way more than we really realize, people are influenced by other people. So it's not just what you want, it's what you see other people do. It's not just what you see other people do, it's what you think they want you to do. And these things drive a lot of our behaviors, even if we don't kind of consciously recognize it. And as it turns out, for lots of health behaviors, those social questions are a lot more predictive of what you're going to do than what you want yourself. So this gets us to just the idea of what's a social norm. And so I'm going to use a, a particular definition that, that comes from Christina Bicchieri. Uh, so we can kind of operationalize this idea without making it a black box that just kind of explains why stuff didn't work when we tried it. And so here's the way we can think about it. So it's a rule of behavior that applies in a particular context. So if we want to use more formal language, we can say it's a rule R that applies in a particular context C for a population P. And an individual within that population has a conditional preference to follow this behavioral rule if two conditions hold. First, they have what are called empirical expectations. That is, uh, they believe others in that context within that population follow that rule. And two, they have normative expectations. Namely, they think other people in that context within that population uh, want them to do that too. So I see other people doing it, and I think I will, they want me to do it as well. And so then, if those two conditions hold, then I'm going to follow that behavioral rule. So that's kind of a, a formal way of thinking about norms. But norms can uh, do other stuff for us. And we've kind of appropriated norms for a lot of different purposes in society. So one is norms can express a lot of values for us. right? So they can help form our group identity. They can give us a sense of a social identity or contribute to it. They can represent aspects of, say, honor or dignity or respect. 
or trustworthiness, all sorts of things that we really care about. Importantly, norms also often involve sanctions, whether those are positive or negative. Right, so for following the norm, maybe you're rewarded somehow, you're held in higher esteem by your colleagues or peers. But if you violate the norm, maybe they, uh, they punish you somehow. And punishments can be really minor, like rolling your eyes at somebody, or not inviting them to dinner, or stoning them to death. Right? We, can, we can think about a continuum of punishment in the same way we can think about a continuum of, of esteem that one can get from norm adherence. But really importantly, what norms are, are interdependent actions and expectations. Your behavior is held in place not just by what you want to do, but what you see everyone else doing and what you think they want you to do. So even though norms are kind of in our heads, they govern a whole lot of our behaviors. And they're really hard to change individually. I can individually convince you it would be a great idea to change your ways. But you can't if you think everyone else still wants you to do that thing. So the core concept here. I'm sorry, can I ask you a question? Oh, please. So sanctions? Yes. Are they always overt? Or no, so I mean, it, some subtle form of shunning? Oh, sure. So I mean, rolling your eyes really counts. Uh, so my kids. So, right. So you can think of uh, you know, positive or, or negative sanctions can be really small. It can just be, you don't seem to be invited to the party that often anymore. Uh, that's a that's a punishment that we're really good at tracking, right? Uh, at a party, if someone doesn't kind of open themselves up to you when you come over to talk, they're shunning you, right? Even if they don't intend it, that's how you read it. That's how you interpret that situation, and you kind of go through what did I do to offend that person? You know, why why am I being punished right now? We're really 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 sensitive to this stuff to the point where. Like a, someone mildly like teasing you and making a half-joking comment, you pick up on quite strongly. Right? So it doesn't have to be you know, stoning to death, though sometimes that stuff does happen. It can be much, much, much more mild, and that still is going to shape your behavior pretty dramatically. So the, the core idea here is a notion of social expectations. And that's just... Uh, social norms are held in place from the stuff in our heads, from what we, what we think other people are doing, and not everything is stuff that we can see. Right? I assume everyone brushed their teeth this morning. I don't have a camera in your bathroom to check, I promise. But I'm pretty confident that's what you did. Why? Because we live in a society where everyone's supposed to brush their teeth in the morning and things like that. I'm, I'm pretty sure that's what you did. It'd be a revelation to me to find out that you did. And so, likewise, even if I don't see it, I'm pretty sure that's what's going on. Other things I can monitor, I can see everyone's wearing some form of footwear, I can see everyone's wearing clothing, everyone's wearing clothing of a certain kind, right? These are things that I can track pretty easily. Uh, and so I have, I'm gonna have a set of expectations for what is acceptable, like if I showed up 45 minutes late to this talk, people might be a little annoyed with me and Kavani probably wouldn't invite me again to give a talk. Uh, and so even though that's not going to destroy my academic reputation forever, I still don't want to make people angry. Right? I'm going to show up on time for things. So even if it's a mild tension, even if I don't have to, no one threatened me that that's what would happen, but I took it as reasonable expectation that if I was wildly late or I showed up drunk or something like that, it would be really inappropriate. right? And so for not just for that reason, but for other reasons, I don't do that. right? And so these social expectations kind of guide our behaviors in important ways. So we can think of interesting examples of how social motivation can, uh, can push us along. So this is work done by Jack and others uh, in Zambia. Uh, so they were thinking of how can we motivate people uh, to distribute uh, female condoms. So they thought that a, a good entryway into uh, distributing condoms was hairdressers. So uh, women uh, tend to go to the hairdresser quite a lot in these communities. And so they thought, well, what we'll do is we'll uh, train hairdressers to talk through uh, how to use female condoms. They can talk to the people while they're getting their hair done. And then we'll offer them incentives to distribute them. 
So one version was just a financial incentive that was fairly small, like a penny every time you sell one. Uh, one was a, a pretty substantial financial incentive. And then interestingly, another incentive was uh, gold stars on the wall, like you might have had in kindergarten class, for who well, you know was nice every day, you get a gold star, and you can track who has as many gold stars. This just tracks how many condoms did you give out. Your name and the number right afterwards. So you can kind of track who's doing the best in the room. So financial rewards, even a large financial reward that was kind of fairly significant, wasn't really different from just no reward, just asking people to do this as a favor. What made the biggest difference by far, you know, doubling performance essentially, was the gold stars. This sounds silly, but think about, like, I mean, this is the same thing, excuse me, as doing something like an employee of the month program, which are wildly successful. We can look at even financial, like, uh, kind of large financial firms where people would rather get the equivalent of an employee of the month certificate in like a good parking space than like a $10,000 bonus. So we talk about this in the, the World Development Report 2015. Uh, social incentives just work way better than financial incentives in lots of situations. Especially we want to kind of motivate people to engage in repeated behaviors and this works in the health context really well. So thinking about kind of provider support. Can I say one more thing? Yes, please. So how do we distinguish, I mean in this case the gold stars represent not only the outward like uh, clarity on mm -hmm. how many condoms that particular hairdresser might have sold, but also a way for the hairdresser herself to track her behavior, so the whole what gets measured gets done thing. Right. right? That, so how do we d distinguish the norm? Right. Well, so because you can, uh, you can do this in two ways. This has been done in a few places, but not it wasn't done in this case. Uh, you can privately tell people, how are you doing? Versus publicly displaying how everyone's doing in comparison to each other. When you do the public display, it works a lot better. Even if you do the private information, so this has been done with tax compliance and uh, water and electricity usage. Uh, if you just give people their absolute performance, like you get your water bill, you just see how much water you've used. That doesn't do a whole lot, but if you tell them how much water they've used relative to, say, their neighbors, and it has to be kind of like their immediate neighbors, that will drive their behavior. So in a very interesting series of studies done by OPower looking at electricity usage in the Western United States, uh, people were, re were given a water, uh, their electricity bill that would either say they were using more or less than the average of their neighbors. Interestingly, uh, everyone was driven initially to just do average. So if you were using less electricity than average, you started using more, which was a problem. So they were trying to get everyone to use less. But if you're using more than average, you're brought down. So they were trying to figure out, okay, now what can we do to make sure that the people that are using less than average keep using less? And they used a very high technology tool to make this happen. They added a smiley face to the bill. They said, you're using less than average smiley face. <laughs> this made an enormous difference and kept people <laughs> using less. And so they're like, wow, this smiley face technology is powerful. <laughs> Let's deploy it to make the people that are above average even more driven to use less. So they introduced frowny face technology. <laughs> they brought in frowny face technology, but then what happened? Uh, people got irate. They started calling up and saying, how dare you judge me? This became a real problem. They had to take the frowny faces off the bills. Because like, people were like, I'm paying, what's the problem? Blah, 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 blah. They got really angry. They felt like the frowny, the frowny face was judging them. Because we're really cued in to faces, as it turns out. You can even do this with like, uh, if for instance we're supposed to pay 25 cents to have a cup of coffee. If you just put three dots that are kind of in the shape of an eye and a nose, that's enough to make people pay more often. Just because they feel like it's eyes watching them. We're really good at tracking this stuff. It's just kind of built in. Uh, so then there's another sort of way of thinking about social norms in this sort of uh, context is, is thinking about uh, 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 latrine use. 
So traditionally, for a very long time, this was considered an engineering problem. Uh, in the developing world, about 1.5 million children die every year from preventable diseases like diarrhea, uh, just because of uh, uh, water pollution. And so, uh, for a long time, this was viewed, okay, we have about uh, one and a half billion people that don't have access to toilets. We just need to build some toilets. It's an engineering problem. We have some amount of money. We have a, we have a set of materials we need. We'll just deploy engineers to construct a bunch of toilets for people. Uh, this is what major development organizations did for a number of years. And they would, like, their success indicators were just how many toilets were built. But as it turns out, they built really nice toilets. These nice buildings were often the nicest buildings around. And so people, being very smart, uh, used them for high economic value purposes. They would store grain in the latrines. They would uh, keep animals in there overnight to avoid cold. Uh, very intelligent folks that don't have a germ theory of disease view a nice building that some nice NGO built for you, they're going to use it for a good purpose. So you don't see any benefits from the toilet construction because people are just being smart and using it for high economic value purposes. So the, the kind of revolution that's occurred with this is thinking about this not as a problem of just material supply or an engineering challenge, but instead thinking about, well, it's a behavioral challenge. People aren't using toilets. So how do we motivate people to use toilets? And the CLTS program, Community-Led Total Sanitation, is structured around the idea of getting people to rethink what's going on with open defecation. So they think, uh, uh, they encourage a process of uh, triggering a, a notion of disgust with the amount of feces that are in your built environment. So where the food is, is right near where the feces are. This is intuitively unappealing to people. We have a very strong disgust reaction. Uh, so a facilitator kind of encourages uh, a realization without kind of saying it. So people can discover for themselves that they're in a, a, a dirty environment on their own lights. And this uh, encourages them to kind of uh, decide to do something different. Right, so they decide to build toilets, and the facilitator happens to have some suggestions for how to go about doing that. Uh, and then people commit to building themselves latrines in a certain number of weeks. Then they can kind of build a social norm around this, so they monitor each other, making sure everyone is using latrines. They introduce some sanctions. Sometimes they're a bit stronger than I would like. Sometimes people go around with sticks and hit people. Uh, but it's. Uh, structured around positive sanctions. There's a big party to celebrate when a community is certified as open defecation free. People from surrounding villages get to join in and they get the idea that maybe they want to do this as well and it can kind of carry out from there. So instead of thinking about this as an engineering challenge, it's thought of as a motivational challenge. It's how to kind of rethink your environment and create social incentives around doing the healthier thing. And so this has uh, 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 greater success than just viewing it as an engineering challenge. But just in general, we can think of lots of cases that we can kind of re-understand as social problems. So there's a lot of academic literature showing that binge drinking, particularly on US college campuses, we can understand as a social norms problem, not an individual problem. People tend to not want to drink as much as they actually drink. They think everyone else wants to drink more and wants them to drink more, so they drink more. But everyone is just mistaken about what everyone else wants. Uh, smoking and obesity, particular exercise and eating habits, these are very strongly tied to social norms and social networks. Uh, hand washing, female genital cutting, going to the hospital for, say, birthing or anything like that, that's very often tied up in a social norm. Uh, another kind of important thing for equity concerns is uh, hospital staff discrimination against, say, sex workers or uh, men who have sex with men and things like this condom use, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There's lots of cases where we can kind of realize that what's going on here are social expectations driving behaviors, not just personal preferences. So just to kind of wrap things up, there's kind of two things that I want us to think about that we might be able to bring out questions. First is a diagnostic. So it's really hard for us to identify social norms if we're not asking about them. If you look at normal KAP studies, knowledge attitudes and practices studies that are very often deployed in these sort of circumstances. They ask, what do you know compared to what the researcher wants you to know? What are your attitudes compared to what the researcher wants them to be? 
and what are you doing compared to the target? They don't ask you what you think everyone else is doing. They don't ask you what you think other people want you to do. They don't ask what like high esteem individuals are doing. Uh, they don't ask aspirational questions. And so for these reasons, they're not capturing the stuff that we can use to identify whether there's a social norm present at all. And if we don't know it's there, we can't act on it. And so that's, that's deeply important. We need to think about uh, whether we can uncover the presence of a social norm before we can think about interventions. The other thing that we want to think about is that there's a real risk in trying to create a new social norm for people if you're an outsider, or get rid of a social norm that you think is, is unhealthy and destructive. Because in a very real sense, it's just kind of potentially crash social engineering that you're engaging in. Right? You're telling people, be different, have different rules. And so uh, lots of failed norms efforts are just a third party coming in and saying, do something different. And this is really rife all over the literature with female genital cutting. It's people outside coming in saying, do something dumb, do something else, do something different. Uh, you're abhorrent, don't you realize that? That, unsurprisingly, fails immediately. Uh, people don't like hearing that they're doing awful things to their kids. So I think a way of avoiding this is trying to make sure that we're engaging in a more deliberative process. So uh, in the case of FGC, uh, the NGO Toast on has a really interesting model where they view the policy person as more of a facilitator rather than a, a, someone coming into the plan. So they have the information as people are interested in it. It's a more of a pedagogical focus, so it's kind of uh, pulling things out of people, so sort of a Socratic idea, uh, getting people to think about what values do they care about, how do they express those values, are those expressions in line with other larger values that that community shares? How do we want to be in the future? What do, what do we want to be like? And so then the, the people themselves determine their own goals and come up with ways of realizing them. So this is a slower process. The toast on kind of project cycle is about three years. And they don't even start talking about FGC until a year two and a half. Uh, but the idea is that uh, people kind of come to this decision for themselves and they kind of own the process rather than kind of being given to it. And that's a very different way of understanding what's going on with, with an intervention. So uh, I've probably gone over time already, so I'll just stop here and say thanks, and I'm very happy to take any new questions. We're open for questions. Or do you think it would be good to press up some questions for people to uh, down? Oh, sure. How, sure. How, no, how, no, that's, no, go ahead. Go ahead. Cool. <laughs> Sometimes we pass out post-it notes of multiple colors today, but then we just, just yeah, here. Pinks or yellows today? Pinks. <laughs> 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 okay. Pinks. And maybe you could just jot down social norms that you observe related to health. Um, and maybe explain how you're seeing those operationalized kind of in the world around you, or in the lower middle income country setting. If you need a pen, you let us know, we can give you something. And we might just give everybody a second. And then we can think about social norms that are relevant to your, to your work, and maybe challenges that you face in either measuring those or changing them. But let's start with like just your observations of norms. Um, and we can go from there. And while the post notes go around, I do I do have a starting question to, to kick us off. So your second at, at the at the very end, your second point, and thank, again, thank you very much for the presentation. It was really intriguing. I'm, oh, I'm really quite excited. I'm a faculty member in architecture, and there's some kinship with one arena of our field referred to as environmental psychology or environment behavior mm -hmm. and an understanding of how the built environment has some impact or influence on social behavior and mm -hmm. so forth. Uh, so the question is about your second point in the notion of risk and risks. As soon as you talk about that, there is certainly, there must be 
quite an ethical debate in all of this when you talk about social norms and change, oh, sure, and I yeah. think of philosophy as one of those disciplines that engages ethical mm -hmm. debates in a pretty significant way. What are some of those ethical boundaries or the, the key parts of this discussion? That's a fantastic question, and I think you're, you're right to pull that out. So uh, this is always a challenge, especially when we're engaging with a, a population different from yours in some sense, when it's mm -hmm. uh, a different set of standards. Uh, so usually uh, the answer I give when we're talking uh, to someone like UNICEF or the World Bank is, uh, well, conveniently those organizations have endorsed the notion of universal human rights. And so uh, human rights are something that we can fall back on as a way of understanding kind of the, uh, uh, the kind of core set of protections that everybody gets just for being human. That said, it can be more complicated than that because there's lots of ways of instantiating a right. And the basic problem in the background of all of this is that there's uh, what philosophers talk about as paternalism, right? So um, when do I get to kind of cut off your options to do what's good for you? And uh, when we're talking about adults, it's really tricky to endorse uh, saying that they, they can't make informed decisions for themselves. And so the, uh, I think the, the best thing to do is to try to in, kind of engage in these, these values deliberations. And so there's been some really interesting work done on how to carry out a values deliberation and, and what process that looks like. So I think when I use the word facilitator, I really mean a, a facilitator, not someone coming in and saying, here are the values that you should endorse. Or rather, how can we understand the core values that that community already has uh, in a way uh, that the expression of those values are better in line with a human rights agenda. And where this gets trickiest and where I'm more kind of personally inclined to think that something like paternalism might be a good idea sometimes is when we're talking about gender issues. Uh, because sometimes for some communities a real core value is that men are more important and more valuable in certain kinds of ways and women have a functional role that is that is lesser than the, the role that men play in that community. Uh, and so there, uh, there have been some interesting efforts to try to undermine that, but not directly. Uh, so ways to get people to realize that like their daughters have as much value as their sons and things like this. But uh, I don't think this is a ethically settled issue for the, the best way of approaching it, but I think the, the strongest stuff so far is saying, well, we get to rely on human rights. Uh, that's something that pretty much everyone endorses. Uh, and then we get to use that as a way of kind of facilitating a values of liberation to try to get a community on board with, with endorsing these things. So I like to think of social norms as potential embodiments of, of human rights rather than kind of a piece of paper that has a law written down. Up on that in a sense, uh, you know, as you were talking, it just struck me that uh, first of all, it was a terrific talk. Oh, I really you. appreciate everything that you had to say and, and, and laid out for us. Uh, but it just struck me that um, uh, medical humanities, which is an area that I work in and teach in medical school, uh, you know, has a lot of uh, affiliation with the kinds of things that you're talking about, and certainly, you know, when when thinking about this and talking to students about their interactions with patients and about uh, how you translate the knowledge that you have in the sense of what, you know, what, what effective soon, what, what, what interventions, what medical interventions should, should be like, mm -hmm. uh, that, that students need to realize that uh, it's always negotiation, it's not right. top down, first yeah. of all. And so in medical humanities, I think the approach that, that you know, is, is being, is, has, been, has been taken you know, very much, very seriously in the last 20 years or so, is to focus on uh, narrative based, mm -hmm. on narrative based. Mm -hmm. Narrative is a way to, first of all, to learn about what it is that motivates people, right. and what, what, the, what outcomes they're seeking, and then as a site for negotiation to help, help patients reimagine their, their narrative. Mm -hmm. And you're quite right, I mean, it can't be something that's imposed upon right. That doesn't work right. at all. Uh, it has to be 
unpacking for people and, re and revealing to them what the possibilities are, right. are, are uh, you know, presented with and directions they might uh, go in. And I think you know, the example that you just gave about, um, um, about thinking about, uh, you know, about daughters and yeah. in that kind of context right. is suggesting thinking about how the narrative mm -hmm. change. But, but, but one that has to be motivated by the interest of the person speaking. Right, no, I think that's an important idea that uh, when you're suggesting a, a, a behavior change, it has to make sense within the person's life. Right? It has to kind of fit in with the rest of how they understand themselves and understand their role in the community and, and their interactions within it. So kind of the language you're using of kind of what their what their narrative is like and how this fits into the narrative, I think, gets at that sort of idea. It has to kind of make sense. So the uh, uh, the way we talk about this in the in the World Development Report a little bit is around the idea of mental models. So does this fit in with the mental model that you have for yourself of uh, and you know what gender means or or what does a wife mean or a daughter mean? Are these new behaviors kind of fitting in with that in a way that when the NGO leaves, you're going to keep doing this? where it kind of keeps making sense to you. I think that's a really important idea. And the other thing that I think is kind of latent in what you're talking about is there's a notion of, uh, kind of making sure that you're in enabling someone's autonomy rather than inhibiting it, right? So it's not that, uh, so there's a really, I think, fantastic idea in the paternalism literature called uh, autonomy enhancing paternalism. Uh, so this is what we think about when we think about why you get to tell children they have to go to school. Because going to school uh, enables you to make more decisions for yourself later. Right? And so there are some areas of, of paternalism that have that feature, where you're leaving someone uh, in a better off position to direct their own life later. And I think very often, especially in the development context, people go for the quick win. Uh, where they can get a, a success right now, but then leave that population worse off in the future in terms of they feel now more dependent on an outside agent providing change. And I think what's great about something like the Toast On program and some others is that they're structured around enabling people to make better choices in general and giving them tools to evaluate situations and think about how to uh, adjust their narrative and make things fit into their narrative more successfully. And so leaving people in a position where they can make more effective choices after this is all over, because their life keeps going after you leave, I think is a really important idea. So great. Yeah. Um, two things first. Uh, thank, thank you for being here with you. It was a great talk. Um, and second, I'm sorry for just interrupting and walking in late. Um, my question has to do with more the application of this, of this uh, design model. Mm -hmm. um, the work, the work that I do with, in, actually I'm a faculty member out in the School of Nursing, and I'm looking at this, the work that I do, it always comes from a, this tension of marginalized versus the empowered. Mm -hmm. So as I'm looking at this and I'm thinking about so one of the constructs that I work with quite a bit, and that's with stigma. Yes. So looking at this, it, it, it seems like deconstructing these or I guess a society or the social norms, and then using that, using that understanding or th those elements that are left over, it seems like you can almost operationalize those and use them to to empower people now. Right. So my question is, is that is that a fair and, and appropriate way to, to use what you're presenting here? So that, uh, that's very much the goal with this sort of framework. So the, the reason why, besides being trained by her, the reason why I like the Vicieri sort of framework for thinking about social norms is that it's precisely an operationalized definition. It's something that we can use to uh, discover policy levers. Uh, and I think what's a really important and interesting idea when thinking about uh, stigma and discrimination in particular. And so I think uh, this comes out really strongly with lots of hospital workers in all kinds of circumstances. Right. Is that one, you can recognize that there might be multiple norms going on with different populations. Right? We might want to think about what's happening with the hospital workers separately from the people that are trying to access services. Uh, and secondly, we can think that uh, 
it might not be that we want to focus our attention on the people being marginalized or stigmatized. Even though our initial effort is to go after the most vulnerable and try to assist them, it might be that we need to focus on the people doing the discrimination. And uh, I think that's a sometimes an interesting revelation that uh, to help the worst off, we need to concentrate on the better off. Uh, because they're the people that are making the decisions, right? They're, they're the people that are kind of causally influencing the outcomes more directly. And so kind of working on making sure that uh, hospital workers say, uh, understand themselves as what their profession is about as being inclusive and, and covering everybody uh, is something you have to do regardless of whatever you're working on with the marginalized groups. Uh, so there was a, a, an interesting case that I uh, did a little bit on with UNICEF a while back where it was uh, trying to make sure that hospitals could receive sex workers. Uh, and the trouble was uh, it, there couldn't just be one hospital that would do it because then no one else would go to that hospital except for sex workers because it would get the reputation of being a sleazy hospital. And so <clears throat> there's a process of convincing all the hospitals that all of them would take sex workers equally and that it was part of the professional obligation of doctors to understand themselves as, uh, as healers and as important members of the community that they would treat everybody. And so even if you could try to convince sex workers that they should go to the hospital regularly, uh, they couldn't go until this stigma was addressed. And you couldn't just do it in one place because that would severely undermine the ability of that hospital to be effective in general. And so that there are really fascinating issues when you get into these interacting populations that we can kind of separate out. Uh, and I think stigma is amazingly important in understanding kind of who do we first kind of work on uh, to think through this stuff. Thank you. Thank you. So, anybody want to um, uh, talk about social norms in your area? What do you think about um, some of the challenges that you face in terms of norms? Hi, um, I'm in the PhD program of epidemiology. So, I did um, a project on changing publishing behaviors among changing school children. And we use a few of the mechanisms that you described. Um, we try to make education skit that incorporate disgust. And we had some trouble trying to incorporate social norms when we have about 30 minutes to one hour to work with 400 children in the entire school at a time. Yeah. Um, we try to teach them a song. We try to teach them pledge. Uh, but from what you describe, I mean, hindsight is only 2020. I just realized we didn't put in like mechanisms for sanction that you know is ongoing as the program progress. Right. It's like one intervention at the beginning, and then we just follow up to see what happens. Right. Um, so my question to you is, in your opinion, how do you get children to sanction each other if you have very limited time to work with them. Right, so the first response is going to be the annoying one, which is you probably need more than one half hour session. Uh, and so some of this is going to be an ongoing effort. So it's fairly unique that a CLTS thing is sort of a, a one-time intervention where you get everyone to kind of quickly make a pledge and, and there are usually spontaneous ideas around monitoring and sanctioning. Um, pretty much every other area of social norms I've come across, it's an ongoing effort before you get to that pledging moment. When everyone kind of gets together and agrees from now on it's going to be different, there's a lot of legwork that's taking place for a long period of time. So one, social norms things aren't kind of quick fixes. It's usually kind of a, a process of engagement. The other thing that I think about, especially in this sort of case, and this, especially when you're working in development sort of context, I really, really discourage a third party coming in and suggesting a negative sanction. That's just creating bad news almost right away. Uh, much better is to think about some kind of positive sanction that you can start getting going, especially when it's like kids, 
you know, gold stars are great, stickers are great. Uh, things that are kind of uh, a small little fun thing that you can feel proud of yourself about. So we use this all the time. Uh, so think about in the US context, uh, relevant right now is when you go vote, you get a little I voted sticker and you get to wear that all day and feel superior to everybody else. <laughs> That's why you get that sticker, so you can feel better than everybody else and everyone can see that you did it, right? And that makes them want to feel that way too and they go vote and they get the sticker. So That's the only way you can get them. You can't buy it at CVS, right? Same way with uh, blood donation, right? You get the be nice to me, I donated blood today kind of sticker. Those aren't silly, those are really powerful tools. And so thinking along those lines uh, in these sorts of cases is smart. So what can the, the teacher do like every week, you know, to say, you know, who washed their hands every day this week? Let's, uh, they get to pick the song that we sing or whatever, whatever it might be. What is the little bit of social recognition that you can offer for someone that did an especially good job this week? Right, and use that to kind of motivate friendly competition in the right direction. Uh, introducing a negative sanction is really likely to be dangerous on equity grounds. Because the, the people that are gonna have the hardest time with a lot of this are gonna be the people that are the worst off at home usually. And you don't wanna kind of double burden them by making them feel kind of socially excluded and materially deprived. That, that external imposition of shame. I think yeah, it's it's, it's really it's really risky yeah. to do that. Yeah, and it's, it's a classic yeah. CLTS, the Community Lead Total Sanitation, is supposed to be about a, a like natural a sense development of, yeah. of right. collective shame, not right. about not individualized shame. Yeah. The school led total sanitation is a bit of a departure from there, and that's where like kids and Nepal will go around and you know blow into whistles when they catch somebody defecating in the open. And at first I was like, oh, that's cute. And then I was like, you know, it's people said to me, that's not cute, that's bad. Yeah, like, that's... that's like shaming individuals, which really, as external parties, is not, it's not a, it's not a right to do it. It's not a yeah, that's, appropriate right? So that really hurts external kids. pressures to shame, we should res really resist at all costs. Yeah, I mean, no praise is okay. But external recommendations for, I mean, it's, it, there's a positive there that I think is less risky than the negative sanction. Right? Right, so I think when you're saying sanctions, you, I mean, we classically negative, think yeah. about it right. as a negative thing, but you're Same, thinking positive. Exactly, positive, positive or negative. So think about the, uh, the O-Power example I offered before. Uh, people have no problem with an external agent offering them a smiley face. People got really worked up about the frowny face, and that's adults who own homes <laughs> getting a frowny face on their electricity bill that they have no trouble paying, right? Yeah. So they called him? And they got really upset, and that had to end within a couple bill cycles, right? That was, that was, people got really worked up about it. Now think about vulnerable children who are still forming their social identities. Mm. You don't want to be giving more reason to do external sanctions, or negative sanctions. Kids come up with plenty of reasons on their own to sanction each other negatively. Uh, much better to focus on positive ones, and as Pavani was saying, anytime you can kind of introduce a group reward, uh, that's even better in some sense. You want to make sure that people feel like it's a, uh, a larger project that we're all engaging in, uh, not kind of individually uh, who's doing a bad job. I mean, uh, and really, like, you know, traditional CLTS, the way it right. was originally coined, right. the facilitators are supposed to be really dispassionate yeah. about exactly. what it's the Exactly, it's the community itself is. that comes up with this stuff. Right? So like, you want to eat your shit, eat your shit, I don't care. Right. Like, that's what it's supposed to, that's on you, if you want. Right. And I'm not going to get worked up about it. Right. right? And exactly what, like the, the role of facilitators in these, in these sorts of things is usually to kind of draw things out of people and as much as possible, do that without any sense of judgment whatsoever, right? So just have people realize what they what their values entail, not kind of impose what people should be like. And as we've seen, like the explosion of CLTS around the world, uh, a lot of people are going for kind of rapid scaling up of CLTS. The facilitator will come in now and be like, "Okay, you guys are dirty and gross. Okay, trigger moment. Let's keep going." 
And those are the ones that just don't work, right? And the danger is, uh, once you've done it wrong once, you, you can't get a successful intervention again because that population has been kind of spoiled to the notion of this. Uh, as much as possible, you want people coming up with this stuff by themselves. Uh, encouraging positive sanctions, I think, is pretty harmless. I, don't, I haven't seen anything that's had a negative result from that. But as much as possible, you want people coming up with stuff on their own. But if in a school environment, you can think of the teacher doing this, they're used to some, some notion of external positivity from the teacher, I don't think that's going to be dangerous. Uh, but I definitely would encourage, uh, yeah, blowing whistles at each other sounds terrible to me. That sounds really, with kids, that sounds really risky. Anybody else with a different kind of I've got something. So, um, this is concerning use of toilets by individuals with disability, mm -hmm. and especially children with disability. Why I'm bringing this up is um, in India, the toilet is considered to be not clean. Right. So nobody wants anything with their regular life to come in touch with toilets. What happens is children with disabilities are often provided with these wheelchairs which can go around the room, can go around to any space, but they don't want to take the wheelchair to the toilet. Right. It's easy to transfer from a wheelchair to the toilet, but because you cannot take a wheelchair to the toilet because it's not clean, parents often carry their child. The child could be five years old or 15 years old, they carry them mm -hmm. to the toilet. And it's, it's, it's just difficult to find out a way right. around it because right. you can't take anything yeah. there or bring yeah. anything from there here. So. Right. No, that's a really hard problem uh, because that's not so much a, a norms issue, that's a mental models sort of issue, like the notion of what's clean and what's not. Mm -hmm. And that's really, really deeply ingrained. So I, like the, just off the top of my head, the way I would think about trying to approach it is, uh, is there something that can serve as a, uh, as a localized uh, like dirty object that you can switch to. So instead of taking your wheelchair in, can there be like a toilet chair that uh, is like a simpler thing that can go, that can sit outside of the toilet, like the, the room of the toilet, and you can take that in and out, and that's understood to be kind of the, like the transitional uh, thing. But changing stuff, people's attitudes around what counts as dirty and what counts as not dirty, uh, that's not something that a, a half hour intervention is going to touch. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, a, that's like a multi-year sort of process to get people's ideas around that to be different. Um, so yeah, the, a stopgap measure would be something like having a secondary chair that, that can take you into the room uh, as sort of a, like a transitionally dirty uh -huh. uh, thing. But, but yeah, stuff around, stuff around clean and, and unclean those are really, really, really strongly held and uh, hard to change sort of ideas. The other um, aspect that seems challenging is that it's a real small subset. Right? Yeah, exactly. Of, of you know, family caregivers for children with physical disability yeah. is a relatively small subset. And so, like, if the norm is around all children, then sort of looking at understanding that norm and then strategies to shape that norm, right. you know, you can, you can reflect people on what their neighbors do and what their relatives do and so on. But in this case, the next household with a child with a disability might be quite far, they might not be getting together in any kind of, you know, so like really thinking about well, what is the norm of behavior for families with Right. The, caring I, for children. It's just, it's a yeah, lot. The, the, the issue here is it's not clear that it's a social norm problem. Right. Because it's it's not there's a behavioral rule that uh, that applies in this context that the disabled child is failing or not failing to follow. It's this other mental models problem. It's this categorization of what's clean and unclean, what you're allowed to do with unclean things. Yeah. yeah. And that that stuff just applies to everybody. And it's either you can talk about what looks like an exception for in this sort of case, but 
almost certainly if you try to go down that path, it's going to lead to being to view uh, disabled children as unclean, uh, rather than give them an exception to kind of transition between a clean and unclean space with with their wheelchair. And so, uh, the these sorts of mental models are really hard to move. Uh, and it doesn't feel like a norm sort of thing for the, some of the reasons that Pavani mentioned. It just it doesn't seem like it's a, a rule of behavior that applies narrowly. It's kind of how you frame the world in general between clean stuff and unclean stuff. Uh, and since yeah, there's not a high concentration of this in one place, uh, it's gonna be hard to use normal social norms, these things there. Instead, I'd encourage you to think about uh, stuff around mental model changes. Uh, and then the stopgap measure would be something like kind of what can be the equivalent of an airlock for for something transition between clean and unclean spaces. So I've been work I was working on a literature review regarding the train use mm -hmm. and you come across a bunch of different interventions like you mentioned CLTS and subsidies for construction and incentives right. and also sanitation marketing. And what I just found was really interesting is that um, sometimes different the different interventions work better in other in some populations than others. And I just wonder I know in one case there are in some parts of India where they do provide subsidies. Um, people who shouldn't be receiving subsidies are getting them mm -hmm. because they feel that it's unfair that people below poverty level are actually receiving mm -hmm. these subsidies. They feel that they should receive them as well. So I wonder yeah. how can you impact that so that way the people who actually need the subsidies right. get the subsidies and how, I guess, kind of changing the attitudes mm -hmm. that way so that way the funds are going where they should be going. So money is always uh, tricky to think through uh, for a couple reasons. So uh, one one easy reason why I see kind of different results with what looks like the same project in different kinds of contexts is that it's not clear that those populations all see the intervention in the same way. And uh, money is really easy to generate. Uh, these kinds of issues. And I'll just give you a, a really simple example of this and then we'll see how it applies. So uh, there's a big difference in how you interpret the same amount of money depending on how it's kind of brought to bear to you. Uh, so there's a really great paper uh, called A Fine is a Price uh, by Gnizzi and others. And here's a setup. It was looking at a, uh, uh, a series of daycares in Israel and there was a problem with uh, parents coming late to pick up their kids when the daycare is supposed to be closed. And so the economists uh, that wrote this paper were like, oh, uh, economics has the obvious answer, just find the parents that show up late. All you need to do is introduce a financial incentive and we work things out. And so they did a nice RCT, so some uh, uh, daycares had no fine in place, some daycares put a fine in place. What they find, the daycares that put a fine in place had an increase the number of parents that showed up late. Why? Well, it's because the parents interpreted the fine just as the fee for showing up late. So what was before done as kind of, oh, I have a social obligation to show up on time, turned into, oh, now there's a price for showing up late. And there's a new service that the daycare is providing me. I just pay, and I'm allowed to come an hour late now. Uh, some people feel this way about parking tickets, right? They're just like, oh, it's just the price of that parking space is $50. I'm in a hurry. I have a lot of money. OK, $50, right? No problem. Uh, where the purpose of it is this is an instantiation of a sanction, right? This is an expression that we don't want you to do this thing. But if you understand it differently, uh, it changes. And so when we think about subsidies, we can think about subsidies in kind of two ways. And it depends on how we're presenting this to people, how they understand it. One is, I'm paying you to do that thing that I want you to do. Right? And so you're my employee, essentially. 
uh, do this thing that I'm asking you to do and I'll give you money. And this interpretation might be why, why are those people getting paid to do the job and I'm not getting paid? We're both doing the same new thing. Those guys are paying one group and not me. Why, why, why would I be a sucker and do work for free? Another way of understanding money is uh, this money enables you to do that thing that you wanted, but you couldn't because you were constrained. And that has a different interpretation where, well, we all want to engage in this new behavior for our own reasons. And if I'm better off than some other people, I can, just, I can do it. And that's great. Whereas those people might need some assistance to do that thing. And it's good for all of us if all of us are doing it, especially around the latrines, right? We all benefit if everyone's not openly defecating. I don't benefit so much from my toilet use, I benefit from your toilet use. And so on that model, it's, oh, well, we all, we all want to do this thing, and some people just need some help to be able to get there. And so when you introduce money, it's really important that you're introducing it where you're not invoking kind of the, the employer-employee relationship, but you're invoking this, um, you know, uh, you want to do this thing and I can help you with that thing that you wanted to do already. Uh, this is why money is a, a, a problem, it, like in-kind gifts operate better sometimes for these sorts of reasons. Uh, in the same way you can think about like, uh, if you ask your friends to help you move between apartments and you give them beer and pizza afterwards, they're pretty happy. If you give them the cash value of the beer and pizza, they're going to be pretty insulted. Right? Because uh, now you're their employer and you're giving them less than minimum wage, right? They're not going to be your friends very long if you keep doing that. But beer and pizza, even though it's technically the same, same financial incentive, they feel like uh, you're returning the favor with a token of appreciation, not like cash. So money's always hard because we interpret it in various ways, and money tends to crowd out other kinds of incentives that we want to operate with. But a key idea and why we see a lot of variation across what seems like the same intervention in the different environments is that the people uh, who we're trying to serve don't view it as the same intervention. They're interpreting things differently. And it's really important to understand how people see what, what's going on. Uh, and anytime money's involved, that's really crucial. So you don't want people to feel like they're an employee. Because one, as soon as you stop paying, they stop doing the thing. But then if you're kind of trying to target subsidies at a, a vulnerable population, the other people are going to get upset because why are some people getting paid for the job and I'm not getting paid for the job? So it's past nine. Okay. Yeah. It's pretty clear to me I can keep listening to this and have another hour of conversation. But I wonder whether we should, any final thoughts or we wrap up and invite Ryan to come again? Yeah. I think that would be a good idea. Um, and maybe we can kind of focus in on a certain set of interactions with that, like work set of norms at that time. But this was a great primer, and we'll be able to post it for all who couldn't be here. Really appreciate your taking the time That's and right. helping us all get on the same page about matters. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Right. You can also approach us and I think it would be helpful. We're yeah. happy to hear on the analysis end of things or review new terms of think about them or whatever. Oh, yeah. um, and that way there's no money. Right. Yeah. 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 Yeah.